Okay, let me now move on to randomized communication complexity, which, as I mentioned before, is somehow more interesting than deterministic communication complexity. So here, um, the players base communication also on coin flips. Uh, so in addition to just getting their inputs and blindly following some fixed deterministic protocol, the protocol can also intuitively involve, you know, Alice will like, you know, flip some coins to decide what she does next. Bob will flip some coins to decide what he does next. I, once again, I'll stress that we're working in a worst case complexity model, at least for now, where it's not that the inputs are random. Uh, you're always worried about the worst case communication complexity over all possible inputs X and Y. It's just that like by using randomness, uh, you might be able to, Bob and Alice might be able to come to the answer quicker using randomness um, than they would on a particular string X and Y than they would uh, without randomness. Okay, so you always require that they communicate at most C bits. In the worst case, they output, the only difference is they only have to output the correct answer with high probability. And actually, one important modeling question, whenever you're defining randomized communication complexity with more than one person involved, like in, let's say, interactive proofs, or in this case, communication complexity, is whether the random bits are public or private. So private is the model that you might first think of, where Alice gets her own coin that she can flip to help her decide what to do next. Same with Bob. But like Bob doesn't get to see Alice's coins and vice versa. Uh, so let's first make this definition with quote unquote private coins. We'll use this notation R sub epsilon, CC just stands for communication complexity of a task F. It's the number of bits needed to communicate uh, on worst case input and worst case coin flip outcomes for a quote unquote private coins randomized communication protocol that uh, for any input X and Y gets the correct answer with prob probability at least one minus epsilon. So for an example of this, I can repeat uh, something that we did in lecture 10, which shows that once you allow randomness and a tolerated small probability of error, uh, you only get this error for, you know, with small probability for any pair of strings. Let's say we're gonna talk about the equality pro problem, I should say. So even if X and Y only differ on one bit, you still only have you know, a one third chance of error in this protocol that I'm about to mention, or the protocol we already saw that uses order log n bits. So the last time we, uh, in lecture 10, we saw a protocol involved in Alice chooses a prime and thinks of her input string as a polynomial and sends like an evaluation of the polynomial, a random evaluation of the polynomial mod a prime to Bob and he checks whether his polynomial gives the same thing. But actually, now that we also studied coding theory, I can tell you a, a different way to solve this problem. So first, uh, before things start, Alice and Bob fix in their mind any quote unquote asymptotically good error correcting code, Boolean error correcting code. Um, with this notation, if you remember way back to coding theory, this notation means an error correcting code where the messages they intend to send are n bits long. The actual encodings are order n bits. The fact that this is just a constant times n is one aspect of being good. And uh, the minimum distance of the code is also a fixed constant 0.1. Actually, this should not say 0.1, it should say 0.1n. Um, but the point it means is that like uh, for every um, two messages, their encoding strings, which are of length big O of n, differ on a 0.1n fraction or more, sorry, a 0.1 fraction or more of the coordinates. Okay, and this uh, two indicates that it's a Boolean code binary code. So they think in their mind like an error correcting code that has these properties, which as I mentioned way back in lecture uh, 11 exist. And now they both get to have a string X and Y and Alice just imagines the encoding of her string in her head, encoding of X, and Bob imagines the encoding of his string, encoding of Y in his head. And now they again want to check whether these encodings are the same or not. Okay, if these encodings are the same, then it was the same strings, X and Y. And if the codings, the original strings were different, then the encodings will be different. But aha, not only will they be different, but like, but since it's an error correcting code, whenever you encode two distinct strings, you get uh, two strings at Hamming distance, at least 0.1n. So you sort of amplified it so that they disagree, not just in maybe one position, but at least 10% uh, of all positions. And then you're in great shape because Alice can now just pick a few, like constantly many random positions in her encoded 
string, send these positions i over to Bob together with the ith bit of her encoded string, and Bob checks whether they match up with the uh, appropriate bits of his encoded string encoding of y. OK, and since you know, uh, it'll always match up perfectly if uh, equality is true, if x equals y, if x differs from y, then the encodings will differ on at least 10% of positions. So I don't know, if Alice picks like 10 or 20 positions, the probability they'll all accidentally agree is going to be smaller than the target error of 1 third. Now notice actually that, uh, that's the conclusion of this, but notice actually where's the cost come from here? This order log n communication complexity came from Alice having to just send the names of the indices. Okay, there are indices into this length order n string, encoding string. So just having to send the names of the indices costed order log n bits. Now, in fact, imagine a scenario where there was public randomness, which basically means that Alice and Bob both get to um, refer to a common public random string. Imagine like these random bits are written in the sky. They both get to look at the same random bits. Then they wouldn't actually need to communicate these indices anymore. They could just get those indices out of the random bits in the sky. The only thing Alice would really have to communicate is the uh, bits in the, you know, these these uh, bit positions in her encoded string. And that's cooler. Then they could even use like a error correcting code with like the best possible minimum uh, distance, regardless of how horribly long the encodings were, because they're not paying for the encoding length anymore. So they could use like the Hamming code, which if you remember has relative distance like n over two, uh, where every two uh, encoded strings that are uh, distinct differ in half the positions. So that's all of which is to just illustrate this fact that in the public coins model, the communication cost, the randomized communication cost of the equality function on n bits with error one third, or even one fourth in fact, is two, which is pretty awesome. And uh, this long Hamming code story I've told you, you can just use it or when you actually compress it down to its essence, it becomes this. So uh, Alice is sitting here with her uh, input little x, Bob is sitting here with his input little y, these are n-bit strings. They both get to look at these random bits that are in the sky, and they interpret these random bits as two n-bit strings, r1 and r2. And then Alice computes r1 dot her string, and she computes r2 dot her string. Those are two bits. She sends those bits to Bob, Bob knows R1 and R2, and he just cross-checks these answers with R1.y and R2.y. If they're the same, he says, I think our answers, our strings are the same. And otherwise, he thinks that they're different. And of course, if they are the same string, Bob will always you know, output that they're the same. Uh, I suppose maybe the, this cost should be three, because Bob has to tell the answer back to Alice. So let's make it three. And um, if x and y are different strings, then, I mean, you could use this Hamming code story, but you can also basically recognize that, um, you know, the difference in these two bits, r1.x and r1.y, is like r1.x minus y. And x minus y is like a non-zero string if x and y are distinct. So r1 dot that is like a random string dot a non-zero string, which has a 50-50 chance of being one. Okay, so uh, let me not dwell on this too much longer, but um, this means the error probability for this protocol is like a half times a half. And in general, if uh, you use k bits, you can get the error probability to be like two to the minus k. Okay, so uh, now we've seen actually that it sort of makes a difference if you use public coins or private coins in the private coins model equality cost log n bits of communication and the public coins model it only costs like two or three bits. Um, so that's funny. It's obviously the case that um, the public coins communication cost is gonna be at most the private coins one. Um, 
because you know if there are, uh, if you have a private coins protocol, you can simulate it with public coins just by like Allison will agree to use like the odd numbered bits in the sky for her random coins, and Bob will agree to use like the even numbered bits in the sky for his coins. Um, but what about the reverse? I mean, this public coins model seems like a little bit wacky. It seems like you're cheating maybe a little bit if you use it. But in fact, it turns out you're not really, thanks to something called Newman's theorem. And Newman's theorem shows that given any public coins communication protocol, you can convert it to a private coins one with not much more error, plus delta error, uh, using just uh, an additional log n bits and another log one over delta bits. Okay, so if you think of like delta as like a constant, it's basically plus order log n bits. Okay, so in fact, you know, this gap between private and public for the equality problem of order log n bits is maximal. And since we don't care that much about order log n bits, that's generally considered like an efficient amount of bits, it basically means that um, we uh, don't really care about the distinction between public and private coins. So we actually uh, can settle on public coins and feel as though we're not cheating, we're really not cheating up to log n uh, bits in our communication protocols. Uh, let me not uh, go over the proof of this in the interest of time, or maybe I'll come back to it after the class is over. Uh, but it's kind of a standard-ish de-randomization proof using Chernoff bound plus union bound. Here's the fast version of it on slides. Uh, okay, so I skipped that proof, but um, let me therefore just say that um, in light of this, public coins is sort of the de facto standard model for um, communication, randomized communication uh, complexity. And now if you have a randomized uh, communication protocol with um, uh, public randomness, then it's kind of like the public randomness that affects the whole protocol is like written in the sky, it's chosen sort of once and for all. And given like the random bit string written in the sky, Alice and Bob are actually deterministic, sort of um, operate deterministically as a function of their input bits and the random bit string in the sky. Or in other words, a, a, a public coin protocol, randomized protocol, can be viewed as a probability distribution over deterministic cost uh, protocols. So cost C public coin protocol it's just a probability distribution over deterministic protocols. And um, the overall error of the protocol is the maximum overall x and y of the probability that the deterministic protocol, when drawn from this probability distribution, gives the wrong answer. Okay, so for upper and lower bound purposes, you know, for randomized communication complexity, um, you know, randomized protocol can really just be thought of as like a, everybody agrees at the beginning, they pick some deterministic protocol to use and then they use that. And that's chosen at random. And um, the error is the probability that their deterministic protocols give the wrong answers. 